Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead, ascended on high, and who will soon come again. Welcome to this service at Calvary Baptist Church. We continue to be in lockdown, so our service is entirely online. Wherever you are, lift your hearts to God in praise. Let me start this service with Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. In this service, we're going to have a time of singing, of praise. Won't you join in, either with your heart or with your voice right there in your home, and sing praise to God. God is with you right now, and he enjoys your praise. So worship him together with us. And then we're going to come to a message from God's Word. I'm going to speak from Psalm 1 today, and I'll, I'll give you this bit of disclaimer. The message is a bit longer than normal, but please hang with me on it. We are going to approach Psalm 1 from a literary perspective, which is a bit different, but I think you will find it very interesting and, and enlightening because Psalm 1 is a masterpiece. So let's direct our attention to God and give Him praise.
as a literary masterpiece. I was signing up for my classes for year 12 many years ago, and I needed to take an English class. I went to a public high school in the inner city of Grand Rapids. As I looked through the list of English classes I could sign up for, I was surprised to see one was on the book of Job. And I thought to myself, how can there be a class on a book of the Bible? There's separation of church and state. Surely that's not permitted. I was interested because I was a Christian, but I couldn't understand how such a thing could be offered. So I asked my academic advisor, and he said, No, it's all right. We're not teaching faith. This is about the Bible as literature. The Bible is a literary classic. I had never thought of the Bible that way. But when he said that, I could see he was right. The Bible is a literary classic. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Even a hardened atheist has to concede that that psalm is a masterpiece. Masterpiece. A masterpiece is a creation of unparalleled beauty. And the Bible is unparalleled beauty. Whether you believe in it or not, you have to admit it is a masterpiece. Today we want to look at the masterpiece of Psalm 1. We're going to consider it from a literary point of view. And in considering it from a literary point of view, I think you're going to see some dimensions to this psalm that maybe you hadn't seen before. And all of it will point to the marvel of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in putting this masterpiece together. Let's hear the psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The masterpiece of this psalm is found in its devices, its descriptions, and its declaration. Let's consider first the devices. Literature is a work of art. It's one of the arts. It's like painting or architecture or music. And as with all of the arts, it's not just the surface message, what is said that has meaning, but also how what is said is said that has meaning. And so we want to look at the devices. How is the literature put together? What, is, what are the structural devices? What are the literary devices? And what interpretation do we draw from looking at this as literature? The structural devices, that's, that's how the, the, the literary piece is laid out. And what we notice right away from Psalm 1 is that the main point, the thesis of this psalm is not found in the opening verses like you would expect it to be, but the main point is found right in the middle, right in the center. It is, you could say, the crux of the matter. Have a look at it. And he, that's the godly one, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And so here's the crux of the matter. There is a classification. It's a simple classification. There are only two, two ways that, that a person might be. You are either godly, verse 3, or you are ungodly, verse 4. And this classification is, is what makes all the difference for eternity. You are either godly or you are ungodly. Every person who has ever walked the face of this earth fits into one of these two classifications, godly or ungodly. Now, I find this simplicity, that there are only two classifications, refreshing. Because in our world today, there is an ever-increasing number of classifications. There are racial classifications. Black lives matter. But don't you dare suggest that all lives matter, because that would be offensive. We have this classification. There are black lives over here. There are some Asians who are saying, no, we are victims of racial discrimination too, and that's coming out in the news right now. And I don't doubt that. I don't dispute it at all. Racial discrimination is a bad thing. It is an evil and it has and it does occur. But here again, a classification, we are Asians. And then there are some white supremacists who would say, we are white, and we have all of these classifications racially. God only has one classification when it comes to race. There's the human race, and we all are part of it. Then there are socioeconomic classifications. On one end of the spectrum, you've got rough sleepers, what we used to call homeless people. And on the other end of the spectrum, I suppose you would have royalty. And in between, you'd have the rest of us. But there is a, a very finely nuanced system of classification in socioeconomic. You're low class, or you're lower middle class, or you're middle class, or you're upper middle class, or you're upper class. And we've got all these socioeconomic classifications. And, of course, there are gender classifications. God made a gender classification at creation. He said that he created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. 
So God's classification is simple. It's twofold. He made male and female. But today it's become quite complicated. We have any number of gender classifications. The acronym has grown to LGBTQIA+. And maybe there's some more letters that I haven't heard of yet. But it just keeps growing and growing, all these classifications for gender. I searched on the internet, how many genders are there? One website said there are 23. Another one said there are 64. Another one said there were over 100. We could talk about even more classifications. There are academic classifications. Some people have PhDs. Some people... Uh, high school dropouts. There are religious classifications. There are Hindus and Muslims and atheists and Christians. And there are dietary uh, classifications. Some people are vegan. Some people are vegetarian. Some people are kosher. Some people are halal. Some people are gluten intolerant. Some people are lactose intolerant. We have all these classifications. And I'm not deriding as someone's dietary restrictions. I'm sympathetic to all of that. I'm just pointing out we have so many classifications in our society. And I find it refreshing that Psalm 1 says there are only two that matter. Only two from an eternal perspective that matter. What matters is are you godly or are you ungodly? And so in the structure of this psalm, we find the point, the crux of the matter, right there in the middle. And the crux of the matter is this. You're either godly or you're ungodly. There are no other classifications. We also find in this psalm linguistic devices. Linguistic devices. And one linguistic device that's common in poetry are figures of speech. One figure of speech is simile. You know you're dealing with a simile when you see the word like or the word as. In Psalm 1, it's the word like we find, and there are two similes. Have a look for them in verses 3 and 4. And he shall be, that's the godly, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And so the simile in verse 3 is that the godly are like a tree. And a simile in verse 4 is the ungodly are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now, similes are very useful linguistic devices because they take an abstract concept and make it concrete. Let me illustrate. If I were to go out on the street and I were to ask 1,000 people to take a pen and a paper and to just Sketch out for me what a godly person is like, or, or what godliness means. I would get any number of illustrations. Someone might draw a picture of a Bible and talk about moral purity. But someone else might draw a picture of planet Earth and talk about climate responsibility and reducing our carbon footprint, that that would be true godliness. Someone else might draw a picture, who knows, of extraterrestrials or reincarnation. Someone might even draw a picture of himself or herself because I am God and I make the rules. Self-actualization. We would get any number of different images. But when we read Psalm 1 verse 3, everybody has the same picture. The godly is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. All of us have the same picture. The ungodly is like the chaff. All of us have the same picture. That's the usefulness of simile. Now, the psalm expands upon this picture of a tree. Is this picture so beautiful? We don't want to miss any of the dimensions of it. And so it talks about this tree it brings forth its fruit in season. Can you picture that? Can you picture the fruit on the tree? Can you picture that it comes right on time in season? And we instantly identify what that means. It means this tree, strong and right beside the river, 
is right on time. It's right in sequence. Right when you expect the fruit, the fruit is there, and the fruit is good. We're also told that its leaf does not wither. We can picture that, can't we? Vibrant green leaves. It doesn't matter if there's drought or there's pestilence. This tree stays the same. It, its leaf never withers. It is consistently healthy. And then the psalm says, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so we can picture this tree. This tree is comprehensively prosperous. Look at its leaves. Oh, they're wonderful. Look at its fruit. It's perfect. Look at its bark. It's, it's very healthy. Look at its roots. They go down deep. Everything about this tree works. And that, my friend, is the picture of the, of the godly. The godly person is distinctive like a towering tree. The godly person is grounded with roots that go deep into God's word. The godly person is beneficial with fruit to share, with shade to share to others. The godly person is consistent with lush beauty, even when circumstances are adverse. And the godly person is prosperous. Prosperous to fulfill his or her ultimate ultimate purpose, which is to glorify God who is in heaven. You can picture it, can't you? You can picture the godly, picture that tree. Is that the way God pictures you? Is that the way other people picture you? Do you see, do they see you as being like a tree planted beside the rivers of water? Now, the other side, the other simile, is the ungodly. They are like the chaff. And so we picture the threshing floor, and we see that kernel of wheat that is threshed, and, oh, that kernel of wheat is wonderful. It's maybe going to be bread or something like that. But there is the, the inedible chaff that's left over. That inedible chaff is only good for being thrown out. It's a waste product. So in contrast to the godly tree, which is vibrantly green, the chaff is lifelessly brown. In contrast to the godly tree that is strong and is immovable is the chaff that with just a puff of air, it is quickly and easily dispersed. And whereas that godly tree benefits others, the chaff is of no benefit whatsoever. It is utterly useless. Can you picture the ungodly? Do you want your children to be pictured thus? Do you want your grandchildren to be pictured thus? Do you want to be pictured thus? God has given us a very clear picture. And this is the point of the psalm. He's used these devices, structural and linguistic, to make the point. There are only two classifications that matter. You're either godly or you are ungodly. Which one are you? This masterpiece also has descriptions. And so unpacking what it means to be godly or ungodly, the psalm moving out from the center gives us a detailed description or descriptions. Preceding the point is the description of the godly person. Following after the point at the end of the psalm is the description of the ungodly person. Now, the description of the godly person is both negative and positive. It's what he or she is not and what he or she is. So, have a look at verse 1. It begins with this wonderful word, blessed. Blessed means to be unquenchably satisfied and happy. <laughs> now, that's a circumstance of life that everybody wants, to be unquenchably satisfied and happy. Well, this is what's blessed. This is the person. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We have three postures that are identified here, and none of these postures fit a godly person. Godly person is not any of these postures. The first posture is walk. The godly person does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. What's the counsel of the ungodly? 
That is the way the world has mapped out for people to go. And this map is distributed through various means. It is distributed in schools, and increasingly so. From early childhood onward here in Australia, there is a, cur a curriculum that purposely teaches children how they should think and where they should go. It's not so much about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about how you should think and where you should go. And how should they think? Well, they should think inclusively. They should, they, 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 should, they should think environmentally. They should think all of these things in order to be a good citizens. Now, it's not just schools that are distributing this roadmap from the world. The media is distributing it too. Every part of the media is intended to influence you to be who the world wants you to be and to think how the world wants you to think. Even news is that way. It's not objective. News has a purpose. It's presented with a purpose. They want to shape how you think and where you go. So you have to be very aware and very careful about those things. The world wants you to walk in its way. And then it comes right down to our relationships with our peers, maybe even within our family, in our neighborhood, in our workplaces. The world is constantly trying to press us into its mold. It wants us to walk in its way. The godly does not do that. Then there's the second posture. The second posture is stand. The godly does not standeth in the way of sinners. Now standing is worse than walking. If you're walking, at least you're moving. And if you realize, hey, that, this doesn't seem right, you're already moving, you can move off onto the right path. But if you're standing, it takes two decisions to get right. You've got to decide to move, and then you've got to decide to go back to the Lord. Standing. Standing is identifying. It is costing your lot with a group of people. If you saw a, a group of people protesting outside of Parliament, and you went over and you stood with them, then any objective viewer, any person passing by, seeing you there, say someone who knows you, sees you there, they wouldn't need for you to be holding a placard. They would not need for you to say a word. Just seeing you standing with those protesters would tell them he identifies with them. He stands with them. He is for this cause. And so when a person stands with sinners, that person is showing this is my identity. I belong with them. And then there's a third posture. That posture is sitting. Sitting. This is even worse. For when we sit, then it requires three decisions to get right. We've got to decide to stand up. And when you stand up, boy, all eyes are going to be on you. That is going to be pressure packed. And then you need to decide to move. And then you need to decide to go back to the Lord. So it's even more difficult. Those who sit, they sit with a scornful. Those who brazenly mock God and scoff at his word, to sit with them is to settle in for the long haul to say, this is my conviction, and to contribute to the movement. Abraham's nephew Lot illustrates what it means to walk, to stand, to sit where the godly do not belong. He walked by Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, he loved it. He was curious about it. He was intrigued by it. He had an appetite for it. He walked by Sodom and Gomorrah. Next we know Lot is standing inside Sodom and he's bought a house. He is standing there. He is identified. When he gets his driver's license, it lists that he is a citizen of Sodom. And then the next thing we know, he is sitting. He is sitting in the city gate, the place of authority, because he has become one of the council members, one of the leaders of Sodom. No wonder the angel had to forcibly remove Lot before the Fire and brimstone rained down on that decadent city. Sodom had gotten inside of Lot. Don't be like Lot. Lot was not living in a godly way. 
the godly do not walk, do not stand, and do not sit. What do the godly do? Well, the, the positive is told to us in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This is talking about appetites. God purposely created you with appetites. He wanted you to have an appetite for food. He wanted you to have an appetite for relationship. Where, where we get in trouble is when we satisfy our appetites with the wrong things. The godly person satisfies his or her appetite in the right way. We have an appetite for truth. We have an appetite to know God. The godly person satisfies that appetite in the Word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Delight. Delight. That, that desire that... The, the godly person doesn't read his Bible doesn't go to church because they have to go out of obligation. No, the godly person reads the Bible, goes to church, listens to the Bible taught because he or she wants to. They want to know God better. They want to learn and obey his word. Now, that doesn't mean that it's effortless. <laughs> no, it's not effortless. Uh, Satan opposes it. Our flesh opposes it. Uh, you've got to have dogged determination to be reading God's Word. You've got to have dogged determination to go to church. And there are times when we don't feel like it. And there are times when there are interruptions and there are reasons, there are excuses why maybe not this week. But the godly person persists. And in persisting, they experience delight. Now, that delight may not be there initially when the dogged determination has to be exercised, but once we get into God's Word, once we're there in God's house, isn't it delightful? It's delightful. God feeds us. God meets our every need. This is a godly person. Now, before I move on to the ungodly, I, I, I want to just face a fact with you. I, I, I want to give you an advisory. This is a description from God. But what God uses as a description, the world uses as an accusation. An accusation. And I promise you, if you are godly, and many of you experience this, you're going to identify with what I am about to say. If you match the description of godly, you will hear the accusations of the world. Why don't you walk with us? Why don't you stand with us? Why don't you sit with us? You think you're too good? You will hear the accusations of the world. It might come out with something like this. Why aren't you donating to Planned Parenthood like the rest of us? What is wrong with you? You're not walking with us. Or might come out with, hey, where's your rainbow t-shirt? Why aren't you wearing the, the rainbow t-shirt? Don't you know this is Pride Month? How, how come you, you're not standing with the rest of us? Or it might come out with, what do you mean you're going to church? <laughs> no one believes those fairy tales anymore. And they scoff at you and they say, why aren't you sitting with us? If you are hearing things similar to this from family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, rejoice. Rejoice, because they have seen, they have seen that you fit in the godly classification. They may not like it, but what they like doesn't matter. What matters is what God likes. And if they recognize you fit in that classification, you are in the right place. That's a description of the godly. Now we come to the description of the ungodly, verse 5 and 6. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so here we have an allusion back to those postures in verse 1. But now it's in relation to the ungodly. The ungodly shall not stand. They will not stand where? In the judgment. 
In that last day, when they come before the Lord, they will not stand. They will not hold their head high. They will have no argument. They will cower in fear and shame and degradation before the holy God that they had scoffed at and refused to believe in. They will not stand. Not only will they not stand, they will not sit. They will not sit with the righteous in glory, but they will be consigned to eternal restlessness and torment. No place to sit. And lastly, they will not walk. They will not walk in close relationship with God, the Heavenly Father. That's what that word knoweth means, to have a relationship with. They will not have that relationship with God like the righteous does. But they, tragically, of their own choosing, will be consigned to eternal separation from God in hell. This is the lot of the chaff. This is the lot of the ungodly. It's chilling, isn't it? But I want you to know it's merciful. It's merciful. There will be no surprise because God has put this in the Bible right up front for everybody to read. He has told in advance there are two classifications. You're either godly or you're ungodly. And if you're ungodly, this is what's going to happen to you. He has sounded the warning clear. It's in black and white. And every ungodly person has this day, this opportunity to turn from ungodliness and to turn to God and to be saved to become godly. It's merciful of God to tell us this up front. And so anyone who stands before him in that day, or who as ungodly will not be unable to stand, but when they come before him, I have no excuse. God has told us mercifully in advance. He's told you, if you have not yet turned to Jesus Christ for salvation, this is the day of opportunity. Don't waste it. Turn to him and be under the classification of godly. You don't want to be classified as ungodly. Well, we've seen the devices give us a clear picture. A tree versus chaff. We've seen the descriptions. It fleshes it right out. It's very clear what it's about to be godly, what it's about to be ungodly. But lastly and most importantly, there's a declaration. A declaration. Now, you might say, where would the declaration be? We've covered all six verses in this psalm. We've covered it all. What more is there to it? No, there is something more. This is the artistry. This is the masterpiece. It all comes together with this. But to see it, we have to go to a bird's eye level and look down on the psalm. And when we look down on the psalm, we see there is another literary device another literary device that can only be seen from the bird's eye level. And this device has a name. It's called chiasmus. Chiasmus. It's, it's from the Greek. And what it means is a name is revealed in this psalm. A proper name is revealed. Let me show you how it works. Now, chiasmus is a literary device, a structural device, wherein a text reflects itself. The beginning corresponds to the end. Moving in, the next part corresponds to the next part moving up. And then the center corresponds to itself. And that's exactly what we find in the psalm. Verse 1 corresponds to verse 6. Have a look at this. Verse 1 is about earthly distinctiveness, what the godly is not like. And it's talking about the divine favor that the godly has because of their earthly distinctiveness. Verse 6, on the opposite end, corresponding to it, speaks about eternal distinctiveness and divine judgment. What happens to the ungodly? You see how those two correspond? And then we move inwards to verse 2 and verse 5. These also correspond because verse 2 is about continuance delighting in God's law, but verse 5 corresponding to it is about discontinuance or no continuance, despairing in God's, perp in God's presence. The ungodly will not stand. And then moving right into the center, 
where the crux of the matter is found, then we see verse 3 and verse 4 correspond to each other. Verse 3 is about security, the flourishing of the tree. But verse 4 is about insecurity, the wind-blown chaff. So you see how this correspondence, this mirroring happens. That structural literary device is called chiasmus. That's a Greek word. Why is it called chiasmus? It's called chiasmus because if you draw a line connecting these phrases, it looks like the Greek word key. It looks like the Greek word key. Now, for us looking at it with our alphabet, we say that looks like an X. That the Greek letter key, I think I said word, I meant letter. Uh, the Greek letter key looks like our letter X, but they're not the same thing. We'll, we'll stick with the Greek, because that, that's where the name comes from. Uh, it looks like the Greek letter key. Now, why is that significant? And, and how does that give us a name? It's because of this. The early church abbreviated the name Christ with the letter key because the letter key is the first letter in Christ. And so this was a bit of shorthand for the early church. Key equals Christ. The Holy Spirit inspired this psalm. The Holy Spirit structured this psalm. And the Holy Spirit made it so this psalm is a chiasmus. Because chiasmus points us to the person. The person is Christ. Christ is in this psalm. He's in every part of the psalm. He is in the center of the psalm. And why Christ? Because it is Christ and only Christ who makes the difference between godly and ungodly. We are all born ungodly. There's only one way to be made godly, and that is through Jesus Christ. Godliness is not something that is achieved. Godliness is something that is imputed. Christ, the godly one, saves cleanses, and makes righteous any ungodly who turn to him. We are made godly. We don't become godly. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's how godliness happens. And so, as we read this psalm, we recognize it's not a prescription. It, its message is not, here is how you become godly so that someday you can stand before God. That's not the point of the psalm at all. The point of the psalm is Jesus Christ and those who have turned to him are made godly. And so verses 1 and 2 are the description of those people that Christ has made godly. Verse 1, 2, and 3, you could say. And the ones who refuse to turn to Christ are going to fit the description of verses 4, 5, and 6. It's all about Christ. Now, how is it that Christ makes us godly? That, too, is answered by a literary device that we find in this psalm. I've been saying the crux of the matter. The point is in the middle. That's the crux. Crux is the Latin word for cross. Christ makes the ungodly godly through the cross. He died once for the ungodly that he might bring us to God. Do you see it there? The point's in the middle so that we would see the cross. And it's structured with chiasma so we might see Christ because this is the secret. This is the difference maker. And this is the masterpiece. What a wonder, isn't it? Everything is in this psalm. I titled this message, or the sermon, The Message in the Masterpiece. But now coming to the end, I think there's a better title. It's The Messiah in the Masterpiece, or The Master in the Masterpiece, because this psalm is about Christ. Has he made you godly? If not, today is the day of opportunity Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Trust in him, and let the first three verses of this psalm be the verses that describe you. Our Father, you are 
our master, and everything you do is a masterpiece. We glory in you. And may it be that every person who is watching this right now will be classified godly. And if there's anyone who doesn't know you as Savior, may they in this moment cry out to you, Oh God, I am a sinner. I admit it. Please, I believe Jesus died for me. He paid for my sin. I believe he rose again. Oh God, please save me and make me godly. And we thank you, Lord, for all who pray to you in that way, who call on the name of the Lord, you have this assurance. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May we be godly. With all glory to Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. This week, may you walk in the Lord's way. May you stand on his word. And may you sit in the heavenlies with him with this assurance that you are a child of God by faith. God bless you.